informal review of nuclear radiations and their effect on humans, a sunlit pool with all the trimming serves as a suitable launching spot, offering an approach that is sufficiently scientific and scenic. A sunbather exposes herself to an assortment of radiations. Some, such as the solar rays, are heaven sent. Others are nuclear, the same as those which come from an atomic burst, and they're bombarding her from all sides. From the sky in the form of cosmic rays, from radon, a material in the atmosphere, from radioactive uranium found in the water which she just left, and in the earth on which she now lies. They aren't powerful enough to bother our bather. They're less of a hazard than the rays of the sun, which, if carelessly taken, can become too much of a good thing. With all radiations, nuclear and otherwise, it depends on the duration and intensity of the exposure. Nuclear radiations have their novel way of causing injury, but it's neither mysterious nor inescapable. Radioactivity, as represented by the ball, causes electrons to be ejected from their atoms. It's an offensive move based on ionization. Ionization disrupts the structure of atoms of which all living matter is composed. An atom is part of a molecule, and molecules are part of the cell. The cell is the structural and functional unit of all living matter a tiny machine with a basic job to do. Cells operating with thousands of other cells of various shapes and performing special chores make up tissues and organs. Organs are departments in a complex factory, the human body, which is engaged in the manufacture of an important product, life. An atom then seems unimportant and infinitesimal a tiny cog on a small wheel in a miniature machine which, if multiplied millions of times, forms the going concern that is you. But if enough of the cogs are broken through ionizing radiation, the gears grind, the machines falter and stop, the factory shuts down. Each of the four kinds of missiles discharged by radioactive substances has its own ballistic behavior. To observe them attacking the body, they must be symbolized far out of proportion, magnified millions of times. Gamma rays are the most penetrating, but the least ionizing. Not so penetrating, but more ionizing, are neutrons, which are not rays, but particles. Neutrons and gamma rays are external dangers, able to shoot into the human body easily. Alpha particles cannot penetrate the skin. Beta particles can cause surface burns if the assault is sufficiently concentrated and sustained. Both are able to gain entry through the eating and breathing of radioactive matter or via breaks in the skin. Once inside, this so-called hot stuff takes up residence in various parts of the body, giving off highly ionizing alpha and beta particles. And how long does this radio rat race go on? The body will succeed in casting off some of this material, but it is a long, slow process. There's no effective method for dislodging the stuff. No known way of neutralizing or destroying it. There is no method of hastening its half-life, which is the time required for 50% of the substance to decay. With some substances, it is a matter of less than a second. But if you had some plutonium inside you, you wouldn't make any plans to celebrate the event. Plutonium's half-life is 24,000 years. The various kinds of cells which make up the parts of the body differ in their vulnerability to radiation. Most sensitive are lymph cells, such as those found in the tonsils. Next is bone marrow, which manufactures red and white blood cells. Then the sex cells, followed by tendons, and cartilage, as in the nose, muscles, and nerves, the toughest of all. In general, cells which reproduce rapidly and whose efficient functioning depends on that ability are most effective. 
radiation halts their reproduction, which is a simple process of one cell dividing into two. This destructiveness has been harnessed and put to work in the radium treatment of cancer, which consists of cells that have gone wild and multiplied too fast. The manifestations of radiation in the body are many and range from slight to severe. Loss of hair, nausea, bleeding, inability of the body to resist other ailments that make its own repairs. These are some of them. And they may be climaxed by the ultimate symptom, death itself. However, complete recovery is more probable. The illness runs a course from causes to effects. Much of the mystery surrounding it is maintained by the general public, which is determined to regard radioactivity as potent and irresistible as the evil spirits of the Indians. This can be partly explained by man's fear of dangers he cannot sense. A fear fanned into widespread misunderstanding and by sensational speculation on what radiation can do. Radioactivity is dangerous, but to say that it's deadly, period, is as misleading as giving a flat answer to the question, how high is up? The radium-treated dial of your watch, for instance, is harmless. Nuclear emanations became a threat when man isolated such hot stuff as radium and worked intimately with it, broadening its scientific, medical, and industrial use. A threat, however, that has been effectively controlled through observing caution. Not even the atomic bomb burst, man's boldest venture in releasing atomic power, is the DDT of humanity from which there is no escape. For it has its known limits, calling for preventive measures as clear-cut as those doctors lay down in telling people how to ward off infectious diseases. The first and obvious one is, be someplace else when it happens. Distance lends considerable enchantment to an A-burst. But under some conditions, that's a hard rule to follow. Atomic warfare, for instance, might allow little choice in the matter. So if you can't stay away from it, you must stay with it, as safely as possible and properly protected. Proper protection is based on what we know about the penetration of gamma rays and neutrons. The ability of a shielding material to stop them is expressed in half thickness. The thickness necessary to reduce the radiation's intensity one half. In dealing with gamma rays, the half thickness of a very dense material like steel is one inch. That of concrete less dense is three inches, while 12 inches of wood, which is quite porous, is required. Against neutrons, the density of a material is not so important as its ability to slow down and capture the particles. Concrete, earth, and water furnish good shielding. The best shelters, then, against the gamma and neutron bombardments released by an atomic explosion are strong, reinforced structures. That prompt bombardment of a high aerial burst is severe but short-lived, since it is carried up into the stratosphere. It's safe to go into the area under the explosion about two minutes after it occurs. Not so with an underwater blast, however, and presumably in the event of underground and surface explosions. The area is contaminated with radioactive material, which gives off alpha and beta particles and gamma rays. 